I, I always was very skeptical of the Ethereum killer approach. Like, you know, scaling was always a problem as as Bitcoin and Ethereum became more popular. And there was this urge to try and like come up with the next blockchain. Um, and it worked for Ethereum somewhat. But, they, but what I think people forget is that Ethereum pitched itself as something different than Bitcoin, right? It was it was the smart contract, you know, language operating system of the internet. And, and, and so I think if you pitch yourself as the exact same thing, but just better, it, you got to be like 100 times better, right? And I think Polkadot is a more pragmatic approach to like solving this. It's like, we, we you know, Ethereum's not going anywhere. All the kind of DeFi applications and things that are running there, um, are going to continue to exist. Hi there, and welcome to the Parachain Auctions podcast hosted by Kraken. I'm Brian Hoffman, crypto platform product lead, and I'm glad you could join me out here on the cutting edge of crypto technologies. On this show, You'll hear from the leaders and innovators in parachains from around the world. Tune in for insights from the best and brightest about their new projects. Whether this is the first you've heard of parachains or you're a DeFi aficionado, come with us behind the scenes as we explore the technology of the future today. Today, we have with us Alex Melikov, the founder and CEO of Equilibrium, and Jen Shiro. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on. And I'm super excited about today's conversation. Yeah, I... I... <laughs> The audience is definitely not aware of this, but we tried to have this conversation several weeks ago um, during the first batch, and it didn't go so well. I'll, I'll spare everyone on the details of it, but it involved uh, smashing some things and uh, <laughs> some connectivity <laughs> issues, but I'm glad we could get, get back together and uh, uh, make this happen. Um, because I think you guys have like a really exciting project, and um, I think the listeners will, will like to hear more about what you guys are doing. Absolutely. I'd um, love to share all the, all the details. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to just maybe like uh, kick it off a little bit and uh, get, a, get a little bit of background on you and, and how you got started. Um, I, I think, you know, some, we like to dive into uh, founders and, and, you know, engineers and entrepreneurs and, and find out more about how they got started on this. So tell us, like, how'd you get it? How'd you get it going? Absolutely. Um, so uh, our journey as a team uh, actually began uh, quite a while ago in 2017. Um, so we've been working together uh, for quite a long period of time, uh, building on various protocols, uh, various blockchain platforms. Uh, we started off with the developments on Ethereum. Um, you know, all the DeFi things that are currently going on in the market, we take it uh, for granted. But back in the days, it was uh, the a uh, complete green field for building DeFi protocols. And uh, I believe that we were one of the first creating uh, lending instruments uh, on smart contracts. Uh, so the idea behind that project was to um, actually uh, put uh, the repurchase agreements uh, from the world of traditional finance uh, onto the rails of smart contracts and um, actually to, um, um, to fulfill the demand from institutional market players like, you know, uh, different financial institutions, uh, investment banks, and so on and so forth. Um, we even uh, got, got almost licenses in Gibraltar because we were one of the first companies applying for um, regulation uh, according to their GLT, DLT regime there. Um, uh, but eventually we figured out that, uh, you know, the institutional demand was not there. It was very early days for the technology overall. Um, and, you know, a few, few months ago, I, I just uh, uh, read the article when um, I believe uh, was that JP Morgan and um, um, uh, somebody else like Merrill Lynch done the first, uh, the first uh, deal repurchase trades uh, on smart contracts. Uh, it actually took them. Uh, like almost five years to get there. <laughs> so, and so we, we actually uh, were almost like implementing this on blockchain uh, back in the days in 2017. However, we decided, you know, to shift our focus on more retail uh, markets because uh, uh, definitely, um, so as of today, uh, the crypto market is all about retail uh, investors. There are some institutions by far, they are uh, coming uh, more and more aggressively onto the market, like, you know, doing certain operations with cryptocurrencies and uh, putting more and more liquidity into into that uh but still uh like um, um, obviously retail uh, uh plays significant role here 
right? So um, actually, after Ethereum, uh, we uh, needed to to like after building this repurchase agreement platform, we needed to make certain decision how to um, to deal with that, and uh, basically whether we need to build something on Ethereum or we want to look um, at other protocols which might you know which were looking very promising those days, by the way. Uh, right. So, for example, EOS in 2018 uh, was uh, literally uh, emerging and uh, the, the, the activity of developers on EOS was uh, really tremendous. And um, actually, we had like two alternatives to, to be number four and number five or whatever on Ethereum. And uh, again, we, we take for granted that Ethereum was like, you know, the vibrant ecosystem with a lot of projects, a lot of uh, user activity. But um, you know, to, to be honest, in 2018, it was not like that. Just one application, like two applications actually uh, was were popular there. So the first one was uh, the IDEX exchange, if you remember that. Yeah. And the second yeah. the second one was CryptoKitties. So not, not more than that. <laughs> and ev ev everyone was complaining about like what exactly going on, whether smart contracts will um, take their niche or whatever, whether it will be developing in some way. So no one actually was anticipating the current boom of DeFi those days. No one was taking serious. Uh, the interesting serious thing about that, the interesting thing about that is that, you know, you look at IDEX and CryptoKitties and then maybe a year later you're thinking, oh, well, the DEX is really the, the use case that's going to take off and, and dominate. And now here are CryptoKitties, NFTs, they're now coming back and just destroying the market. So it's, it's crazy <laughs> that those two types of applications really did uh, end up proliferating so greatly, you know, Currently. Absolutely, it's it's kind of kind of the loop, right? So you 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 always in the loop. Uh, so uh, whether you know finance overtaking gaming or something or gambling on blockchain, whether gambling or or gaming are overtaking finance, so it's always like that. Um, and um, you know, again, so we have like uh, uh, getting back to to my point. So we had two alternatives: whether to stay on Ethereum and be in like number whatever uh, projects on Ethereum or to bootstrap uh, DeFi ecosystem on the EOS blockchain to be just number one. Um, so we actually took this, this the second approach and so we decided to build the first DeFi applications on uh, on EOS, which was uh, the first decentralized stablecoin there, and I believe the the only. And so the actually we 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 kind of succeeded with this project in the scale of the EOS ecosystem. So we got quite a lot of users. Uh, there were over a thousand user position open on our smart contracts, which is a really good result for for EOS. Uh, obviously, it has nothing to do with uh, all this madness, which is what is going on in Ethereum and um, like Binance Smart Chain, for example, right? Uh, but still, it, it is quite good results for, uh, for, 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 for EUs. And we have even got like over $25 million worth, worth liquidity locked on smart contracts. So it was um, quite, um, quite good results for, for that ecosystem. But, you know, the thing is that everything that we, was, we were building, uh, we were building in, with, the, with the dream about interoperability. Because, you know, interoperability, like from our standpoint, is something that will change the whole user experience will make it more seamless, uh, more comfortable um, in terms of like interaction with uh, uh, blockchain applications. And uh, obviously, uh, there there are several prominent uh, projects that are designed to to solve this problem. But maybe the most advanced one is obviously Polkadot. And um, you know, I have friend, several friends of mine who are actually working for Parity. And uh, as, as core developers, and they were constantly uh, keeping us in the loop of uh, their updates, uh, like constantly reminding us about themselves, uh, like keeping us posted regarding the progress on Polkadot development. Uh, so I've heard first, the first time I've heard of Polkadot was uh, 2017. I believe the guys were just uh, raising the first ICO for that. And um, um, actually, we were again, closely watching uh, uh, their developments. And uh, we were trying to find out what would be the right moment to jump on that development and to kick off development on top of the Substrate framework. So in, um, in February uh, 2020, uh, we found out that, uh, you know, the Substrate framework actually sustained and uh, it makes sense to start doing something on top of that. And we actually decided to, to move to Polkadot right away and to start start building DeFi application there. Uh, and uh, basically the idea behind what we are building is uh, to create the 
maybe the most comprehensive DeFi platform you ever had on, on the market, which will include uh, almost all the uh, sustained DeFi use cases uh, under a single umbrella and um, actually will simplify user experience significantly because you don't need to switch between various uh, you know, protocols and uh, products uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but it will introduce all this functionality just in one single uh, easy to use interface. Um, and uh, on top of that, it will introduce a lot of liquidity thanks to interoperability. Uh, and actually it will um, also be designed to solve the problem of liquidity fragmentation. I will also touch on um, like particular hurdles that we are solving within the equilibrium and Jinchira in a little bit more detail in the course of our conversation. Yeah, great. So that that's <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. Um, you know, thanks for that background. You know, I'd like to just back up real quick. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, you guys have started working on this through Ethereum. You you, you kind of started focusing on the EOS community. And now it's, you know, with, with Parachains and Polkadot and Kusama. I mean, how would you compare and contrast like those different communities? And did you, you know, did you feel like the support uh, is, you know, the support from that community is different now that you're at Polkadot versus EOS or Ethereum? Yeah, you know, to be honest, we do feel the difference here because, um, you know, um, it, it's, it's quite obvious that the positioning of EOS and Polkadot is very different, right? So if EOS was positioning uh, themselves as the Ethereum killer, right? And if you are opposing yourself to the biggest ecosystem um, in the, in the, on the markets, it's actually a very challenging position. So whether you, you become the actual killer or you're basically losing, losing the game. Right. So since, uh, you know, let's be frank. So EOS didn't manage to to become the Ethereum killer so far. Maybe I don't know. Who yeah. knows? Maybe something something will change. But uh, as as for now, um, it's uh, the situation looks like that they have not done that yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, the thing is that the the all the excitement, um, all the dedication from the side of you know investors and users is not there. Right, uh, because uh, the major player, the the major contender, is actually taking uh, taking it all, right, and taking all the attention, uh, all the um, kind of uh, users, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And uh, definitely, Ethereum is obviously overtaking use from this perspective. So, since Polkadot is not positioning themselves as as, as a Ethereum killer, definitely, right, and uh, it's, mm -hmm. there is no contradiction between like Ethereum community and Polkadot community, it's more kind of complementary communities, uh, I would say. And actually Polkadot is uh, uh, kind of layer zero, uh, which uh, might be acting also as a scalability solution to Ethereum. Definitely it's more kind of um, um, conscious position, uh, positioning and uh, it makes way more sense, right? So for, from this standpoint, we definitely uh, um, feel like more attention to our project Right. We, we feel that we are um, kind of aligned with the interests of investors who actually don't want to invest in uh, sort of projects that are built on the platform, which is uh, in opposition to the major player on the market. Right. So there, there are no risks like that, uh, whether it succeed or not here. Right. Because there there again, there are no contradiction. And um, um, it's easier to communicate with the largest DeFi ecosystems. Right. Because uh, you, there, there is no. Uh, ideology behind that. There is no kind of tribalism behind these communities, and um, uh, definitely that's that how we feel uh, building building on Polkadot. Yeah, it's it's uh, funny you brought up uh, the kind of like layer zero blockchain. I, I I hadn't heard that much for a while, and then now recently I've seen more more and more people are trying to kind of pitch themselves as this layer zero concept because I think it really makes more sense you know like the, i never really I, I always was very skeptical of the ethereum killer approach like you know scaling was always a problem as as bitcoin and ethereum became more popular and there was this urge to try and like come up with the next blockchain um and it worked for ethereum somewhat but they, but what i think people forget is that ethereum pitched itself as something different than bitcoin right it was it was the smart contract you know language operating system of the internet and, and and so I think if you pitch yourself as the exact same thing, but just better, it you got to be like a hundred times better, 
right? And I think Polkadot is a more pragmatic approach to like solving this. It's like, we, we you know, Ethereum's not going anywhere. All the kind of DeFi applications and things that are running there um, are going to continue to exist and they need to be able to interoperate. And so I think what you guys are building is, is doing a lot of this, right? It, it's building bridges and connecting these uh, technologies. One thing you brought up also um, in your earlier comments is that you guys, you guys are trying to take a lot of these um, DeFi concepts and kind of put them together in one place. Uh, I think you refer to them as a conglomerate at, at some point and, uh, and, and provide a, a useful interface or an easy to use interface on top of that. That is, to me, sounds like a very, very challenging proposition. I mean, how, how, a lot of people are having trouble just doing one piece of it and doing it properly. How have you guys approached like doing so much, but yet providing a really great user experience? This is a great question, by the way, because, uh, you know, um, definitely it might sound that we have a lot of uh, on our plate in terms of uh, further developments and uh, definitely the use cases that we're introducing in terms of our product line is, uh, you know, has very broad variety, uh, like from from the lending instruments like pooled lending, synthetics, um, decentral, we will have also our own decentralized stable coin embedded into the system back to dollar, uh, back by crypto collateral. Uh, we'll also have um, uh, the decentralized exchange, which will be leveraging these uh, lending capabilities. Uh, but the thing is that, um, like, if we get back to the moment when we were thinking of our platform, how exactly it will be built on um, on top of Polkadot, so our consideration were lying around, like, how we can use this green field to develop mm -hmm and uh, how we can outline the architecture which will allow us for building all these uh, kind of wide variety of uh, products uh, without putting like um, uh, outrageous amount of efforts into building every single product then, right? So um, thanks to the um, core components, core technical components that we have um, uh, developed and actually some of them are bringing up certain innovations, uh, we are not forced to do everything from scratch every time, right? And uh, maybe one of the reasons why we moved to Polkadot, to the interoperable platform, was beca because we were like thinking, okay, so we have uh, uh, more or less succeeded on the EOS, right? But there are some other ecosystems that are also um, looking promising, right? So whatever. For now, it's Solana, Cardano, uh, and many, many others. And uh, does it mean we, that we need to build everything, like the whole business logics from scratch on these protocols to uh, get access to their to their users, to their communities, how we can basically re get rid of uh, the excessive development efforts in terms of creation of your um, of your applications and delivering your functionality to the end users. Obviously, like the obvious solution is to place your core system logics on some uh, blockchain platform, right, which will be the you can think of that as of operational system, right, which will be basically running this application. And mm -hmm. the the other blockchain platforms will be simply connected to this ecosystem uh, through whatever bridges or uh, whatever you call that. And obviously, Polkadot is uh, one of the best solutions here, right? And it's, it's, it naturally matches this um, kind of intentions to build these kind of applications. So getting back to our own business logics, the logics behind our products, so obviously the architecture that we have uh, uh, we have built, we have uh, invented, it actually um, uh, represents a sort of the, uh, the 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 core components which are used by all the uh, products, all these components of the entire entire platform, uh, and leveraging this uh, this kind of core 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 system components in some way. So uh, let let me like name particular components that we have built. So first of all, we have built uh, the uh, risk management system, which actually is used by all the all the products that we have uh, we have created on, in, in our product line. So this risk management system is a quite sophisticated thing, which um, uh, uses uh, some you know best practices from the world of traditional finance. Uh, the idea behind this component is that uh, the system is constantly monitoring, first of all, the volatility of underlying portfolio, Secondly, um, the overall system solvency, and uh, thirdly, uh, this 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 risk management um, uh, module is actually monitoring uh, particular user positions in terms of their utilization levels. 
right? And um, based on this model, we are actually performing pricing. Uh, so pricing in our system, uh, whether it's lending um, uh, lending products like some whatever socialized loans or something, or whether it's uh, trading on margin when you also pay interest. This risk management system is assessing risk of particular positions, whether it's position of borrowers or position of traders, and uh, actually applying certain pricing perspective on each of these positions based on the conditions of the system overall of the market, based on volatility and the condition of this particular position, right? And um, actually pricing in our case is risk-based, right? Um, it, it is actually, it is it is implemented in a, in a position to to utilization approach, which is quite uh, common to the DeFi application, DeFi platforms like Compounds or Aave, they're actually evaluating the cost of loans for their users based on the utilization of particular liquidity pool, right? So the more uh, assets um, actually 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 borrowed from the mm -hmm. from the community, then um, oh sorry, from 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 the liquidity pool. Uh, the um, uh, the more interest uh, this user will pay on on their loans. Um, so uh, what, what what else? Um, so um, how, we so, actually sorry, just not. I, I hate to break it up, but I know this yeah, is a ahead. complex topic, so I just want to ask a few questions as we go. Um, so so you kind of explained a little bit about how like Ave and Compound operate. Um, I think a lot of our listeners probably might use these products and be familiar with that. Maybe you could just explain a little bit more about like how your system uh, is different from that. And you, as far as this risk management kind of uh, module or, or component um, operates, are you guys, is this all self-contained or are you using uh, oracles or data from other, other places to interoperate mm -hmm. with? Like how, how does this function? Yeah, so t uh, talking about uh, different shares uh, between us and uh, Compound and other lending uh, lending platforms, um, I should say that we have um, like first first of all um, a different approach to pricing, which I already mentioned, right? So uh, we we are we are um, actually applying costs on on loans uh, based on, on on risk rather than on utilization of assets. Uh, secondly, we are uh, cross-chain interoperable, right? So we're introducing the wide variety of assets uh, from blockchain uh, platforms that are bridged with Polkadot. Um, as for now, we already have built our own bridges, by the way. So we already have uh, Ethereum bridge uh, up and running and uh, the bridge with the Binance Smart Chain, which is uh, really interesting. It might, um, you know, bring in certain use cases for, you know, bridging assets from Ethereum using as collateral and then whatever, taking loans from BC, which might be a very interesting use case uh, while well, you'll be using that, doing that in this in the single in the single interface. And um, uh, basically, the, uh, the, the another differentiator here that, you know, the, the thing is that we, we, we have the system of bailsman that I wanted to also to touch on because it's uh, the certain innovations that we're bringing in the space, right? So why we are, uh, we're, so first of all, what, what is that? So it's actually the liquidity which is uh, um, settled in the system in advance. And so this liquidity um, um, is settled by bailsmen, uh, by users who are actually taking the most of risk in the system. And uh, in exchange, they're earning a significant fraction of interest paid by borrowers, right? And so these bailsmen, they're taking over uh, debt obligation from borrowers in case of their defaults. So which means that we are not requiring um, kind of uh, third parties or market makers to liquidate loans through auctions like it's implemented in whether it's Compound, uh, Aave, or MakerDAO. So we don't have this functionality of auctioning. And uh, definitely we think that this approach makes the system more sustainable and more, more stable, right? Because no forced actions required in case of market turmoils or something, extraordinary events on the markets, I should say. So who can be a bailsman and like, how do they get involved with that? So actually, um, we expect... Um, all the liquidity providers in the system eventually to become bailsmen. And, um, uh, you know, the, the thing is that uh, to be bailsmen, you need to uh, have the experience of management of diversified portfolios, right? Because uh, being the bailsman, time after time, you will be getting some collaterals and loans that you, you will need to repay at some point. 
And to manage that efficient, uh, effectively, you need to have certain experience. Uh, but thanks to, again, the, the third thing I actually wanted to mention that just besides only this lending functionality, we'll have also trading functionality at the same platform. Mm -hmm. And this, first of all, this trading functionality will be leveraging uh, lending platform for uh, margin trading, right? So uh, you actually can um, uh, can use your portfolio of assets as collateral or as uh, basically as a margin for for trading uh, on the on the spot market. And um, uh, secondly, this this markets will, will allow bailsmen to do certain swaps uh, for those um, assets they they receive from from borrowers and uh, to facilitate the process of you know trading uh, paying back loans and so on and so forth so it will be a kind of very integrated ecosystem which will uh, help users to uh, manage funds within this ecosystem in a very effective way and to earn obvious yield for that um, so maybe one thing also I want to, to touch on in terms of our DEX, which actually like another point, um, um, uh, which is, might be interesting to our viewers. So how? So the, the first thing about this DEX, why it's um, actually unique, is that because thanks to this um, functionality and core system components that I mentioned, we can implement the portfolio margining approach um, uh, you know, in terms of like trading. Right. And uh, this actually differentiates our DEX from any other DEXs on the market because uh, other DEXs that they allow for margining only in one asset. Usually it might be either stable coin or something like uh, something else. But, uh, you know, the more professional approach, which is, in, which is inherited from the world of traditional finance uh, of the actual, um, you know, best practices on the current exchanges um, on the stock markets and so on and so forth. It's, um, it's actually the portfolio margin. And I believe that just a few exchanges, even in, uh, uh, among centralized ones, uh, um, actually uh, enable this functionality. Uh, I know FTX, they, they have this functionality, and I'm not sure that uh, there are any other, other cent even centralized exchanges that are working in the same way. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, it, it obviously seems like that's the next evolution of... Um you know, where DEXs will go. So I think you might find yourself having a lot of people looking at what you're doing and, and seeing what you do right and wrong. And I mean, how do you, how do you guys uh, envision kind of staying ahead of the curve here in that respect? You know, I mean, it's, if, if you do prove to be successful, it's, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, a lot of the DEXs will probably try to adopt this. And, and, you know, we've seen things like, you know, Uniswap, pop up and then sushi swap and they people just kind of like clone these technologies but like how how do you guys view competition and and kind of interoperability in that respect like are you planning to try and figure out how to work with any of these dexes that want to kind of build this out later um so f firstly i think that you know just building DAX is not sufficient to succeed, right? So first of all you need to bootstrap liquidity to make sure that you're working with the right guys um, who are, uh, you know, providing liquidity into your order book um, to, to your liquidity pools and so on and so forth. Um, so first of all, you need to bootstrap the actual liquidity to have the user base and uh, to, to, to get the adoption for your platform. Um, obviously, if, uh, if we manage to, to do so, uh, by far, uh, like we'll have the first mover advantage. Because um, uh, again, I, I'm not sure that any projects um, um, at this stage uh, of their developments are even thinking of this uh, mm -hmm. kind of functionality and have something similar on their roadmaps. Um, so, yeah, and uh, uh, definitely maybe uh, the, the second thing is uh, how fast you can adapt to the, the market circumstances, right? Because uh, uh, just uh, uh, rolling out some, some um, you know, unique functionality is not enough. You always need to be adopting to improve your product user experience and um, roll out some other other new products, new cool features, which will attract more users and um, actually uh, make the retention more kind of um, uh, reliable, I would say. Right. So uh, from this perspective, we do have a lot of ideas how we can um, make things work um, even in better way and how we can improve and uh, we have definitely a lot of things in our pip pipeline uh, how we can uh, basically uh, attract more users and to to, to be more um, sort of uh, interesting for uh, for more sophisticated market players yeah I'm glad you brought up the the point around you know 
you have to kind of provide, you have to bring the liquidity, you have to get people to actually use the products, um, you know, that you're building. It's not just about having features and, and capabilities. Um, so a lot of the ways that these, these um, kind of other DEXs will bootstrap liquidity is by, you know, doing some kind of governance token, the airdrop or, or some kind of way to get people to like get involved right away. Um, how, how are you guys approaching incentivization? I think this probably ties in close with the crowd loan uh, and the auction and, and what you guys are doing there. And I think that's really unique. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you guys plan to actually bootstrap liquidity and uh, mm. participation in, in your software. Yeah, good, good question. So um, first of all, I need to mention that um, we are almost there in, in production. And um, uh, next, uh, like on September the 2nd, we are uh, hosting the Kusama Dima Day event, uh, where we'll, we, uh, we'll, we'll get together all the uh, prominent teams from uh, Kusama ecosystem uh, who will be presenting their developments on Kusama, whether it's uh, actual parachain projects or those who are uh, candidates but already launched their standalone substrates. And also there will be a kind of launch party for, for Jinchira. It's our canary network on um, the canary network for equilibrium on Kusama. Uh, so we decided to kick things off even before we get the slot. Uh, because, uh, you know, we have a lot of developments um, uh, already done. And we think that it makes a lot of sense to roll things out as it is. Right. And um, um, actually, we'll be launching things into production as a standalone substrate. Uh, it will be done in a quite, um, you know, safe way from the perspective of block validations, because we have a prominent uh, lineup of validators already working with our projects. So, uh, most of them are already validating blocks on Polkadot and Kusama. Um, also, I, I maybe should mention that Hobby Pool, even they have uh, joined us recently. They will be also validating blocks on, on these blockchains. Uh, and we actually, we have um, even uh, launched the subscription for early access to our platform. So within the first uh, several, sometime it, the, the platform will be working in the closed regime. Uh, so just those who apply for the access for, for the early access will be able to enjoy its functionality. And um, actually the way how we want to bootstrap liquidity there is pretty straightforward. We have allocated um, quite a substantial amount of um, our um, um, token supply uh, of Jinchiras. Uh, we have Jinchira tokens um, uh, for the Jinchira platform specifically. And we have uh, allocated uh, quite substantial amounts of these tokens for, for the liquidity farming program. So um, uh, we're currently in talks with uh, multiple liquidity providers uh, from the number of our investors and our partners and uh, some of our friends from the markets we, we've been um, in touch like for, for, for a while and uh, talking this uh, liquidity issues, how they can be of help here. Uh, we already have um, quite a lot of commitments, uh, particular ones uh, from, from the side of um, uh, our liquidity providers. For example, uh, we recently integrated uh, DAI into, the uh, into our platform with the, um, in close connection with the MakerDAO team and um, actually stable node company which is run by um, uh, Gustav Arentoft who is uh, one of the leading uh, business developers in uh, MakerDAO um, uh, they are committed to providing some initial liquidity and die onto the platform so and we also have some other commitments since we do have like quite um, um, uh, various uh, like uh, di diversified lineup of assets uh, available on the platform for the, from the day one. It's kind of easy for us to uh, approach uh, liquidity providers who are used to, to, to working with some particular assets. We have some lineup of assets on Ethereum. They will be the biggest, uh, uh, the most uh, kind of established stable coins, um, including USDT, USDC and DAI. Also Ethereum itself, CRV tokens, by the way, because we also are working in collaboration with the Curve team. Uh, I will also touch on that in the course of our conversation. And um, uh, another thing, um, uh, on, on the side of BC, we'll have uh, BNB and BUSD tokens available. Um, so we have quite kind of um, um, a lot of um, uh, things on the table that we can offer to the liquidity providers, specifically this liquidity farming program, which will um, enable them to earn uh, quite substantial yield. Um, our estimation will be in between like 25 up to 40% APY. 
And um, yeah, I think that it will be pretty straightforward way to bootstrap things in terms of Jinchira. And so then we will actually replicate certain best practices that will be tested on, on, on Jinchira first. We'll be actually replicating that on Equilibrium when we will be launching our parachain on Polkadot. I meant to ask you this earlier. Um, how, how big is the Equilibrium team? Like how many guys do you have working on here? And gals. <laughs> yeah, girls are kind of uh, red book animals in in the blockchain space, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> uh, we do have we do have girls, fortunately, on on our team as well. Uh, so we can kind of, uh, in terms of uh, the particular number, uh, we currently have uh, twenty three team members. Um, most of them on the dev side, uh, like seventeen developers. Uh, um, working with us. Uh, others uh, are working on the side of uh, marketing and business development. Uh, by the way, we are hiring uh, right at the moment. We are looking for uh, more talents, uh, specifically like we're looking for international, uh, uh, senior international uh, business developers because uh, we are approaching our production launch and we want to be uh, more active on the side of uh, business development now. Um, and we have other job opportunities, so feel free to reach out to us and we definitely would love to uh, have uh, certain conversations. So we're open to, to, to everyone. <laughs> Great. Um, so you, you, brought, you also brought this up at the end of, the, of your last kind of like uh, comments. Um, you, you, are, you have Equilibrium on Polkadot. You have Jinshiro on Kusama. Um, every project seems to kind of approach how they handle the Canary network versus the main net network uh, differently. How are you guys approaching this? Like, are you going to have two separate networks? Do they work together? Are they the same? And, you know, what are you guys doing? Very good question. So, first of all, uh, we consider uh, Jinchira as a testing site for um, our products, uh, first of all. So, what, whatever developments we will be building, first of all, they will be rolled out on Jinchira. So, Jinchira users will be enjoying sort of new functionality more often than Equilibrium users will do. Uh, but um, Equilibrium users, they will use something which will be battle tested by far. So, um, and uh, actually in terms of uh, Jinchira, we'll be, more ex we'll be bringing in more exper experiments in terms of like assets that it's on the platform, so on and so forth. Obviously, it will be all prominent assets, no shit coins and stuff. Uh, so and no no wash trading and kind of <laughs> suspicious <laughs> suspicious stuff on the on the platform going on. So no backs. All right. So all you wash traders listening right now, you can tune out now. It is not allowed. It's not happening. <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, from 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 this from this standpoint, um, Jinchir will be like uh, more experimental, right? And equilibrium. Uh, will be more conservative. Uh, so there, there will be, again, only um, a major crypto assets on, available on Equilibrium expectedly. And um, from this standpoint, like Equilibrium will be a uh, very solid platform for more, for maybe even more for institutional uh, market participants. Uh, Jinshir will be for everyone. Okay. And then you guys, I mean, obviously, I don't even know why I was going to ask that question. I was going to ask you if you were aware that the next batch of auctions is happening. But of course, you know, uh, <laughs> September 1st, um, just a couple of days from now, uh, the, the next wave of uh, parachain auctions are, are slated to start. You guys are going to be participating. Um, the crowd loan uh, is going to start soon for you guys. Uh, you know, we actually have already kicked off our cloud loan campaign. It's uh, pretty active up and running and uh, we have certain plan for this batch of auctions we actually did some homework uh, as you know we have participated in the previous rounds uh, we didn't manage to get the slot but i th actually think that uh, our participation was quite successful because you know to be honest we have not been pushing our kusama narrative uh, that hard as our contenders actually did that in the past. So like uh, we, we, we just announced our plans with regards to Kusama uh, back in March uh, this year. Uh, but most of the projects have actually participated in the first round. They announced these plans even last year or something. Yeah. So we didn't have that much time, uh, but we, uh, we actually saw quite you know, active community participation in, in that batch of auctions. So in terms of the current crowd loan campaign, uh, we do have something to offer. So first of all, uh, we are the first to establish uh, sort of a downside protection policy. So it means that uh, we have allocated 10% of uh, Jinchira token supply 
uh, which will be used to protect uh, our contributors in our cloud loan um, uh, during the whole periods of parachain lease uh, from uh, KSM downside. So if we figure out, like we first of all, we fix the price of KSM um, at the beginning of uh, the crowd loan campaign. And uh, if it happens that this price, um, uh, the, the price of KSM at the end of the parachain lease um, uh, periods in 48 weeks is below this price, uh, we will use this token allocation to basically compensate uh, our um, contributors, our supporters, uh, this, this downside. And uh, the, uh, we, we expect to um, actually to hedge their risk in almost 50% uh, price drop. And um, the, the, this token allocation will be distributed proportionally to the actual price drop um, at, the end, um, at the end of the uh, parachain lease period. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that's amazing that you guys are, are deciding to do that because, you know, one of the questions we've gotten at Kraken a lot about the parachain auctions is like, well, you know, what 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 exactly am I putting myself at risk for by bonding my my KSM or my DOT to uh, uh, to a crowd loan uh, for these auctions because I'm not going to see it for a, quite a while, you know, and obviously crypto markets fluctuate up and down. Um, it's quite a, a commitment for your community to to put so much into uh, into a project because these funds are not going to you guys. It's not liquid for you what they're contributing, right? It's it's yeah. basically just a a bond to say that they they support this and they want to see it happen. And uh, I think that trust goes both ways. So it's really cool to see that you guys are doing something to to benefit the community. And I think you know I think people should really definitely look into that. Um, but, 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 but the one thing, but the one thing uh, it doesn't mean that you need to go right away and buy KSM. We don't give investment advice, never. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. You do whatever your heart feels uh, content to do, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm really happy to be able to have this conversation with you. We, we learned a lot about Jinshiro today, and there's, there's tons more we could get into. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the time today to do that. But I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with us. And I have one final question for you. I, I hope it's it's it may be an easy answer, maybe a hard answer. Um, it's difficult for some and not for others. But we have something called a chaos score, and the chaos score is a number from one to ten of how chaotic just working on Kusama has been. Because we all know the slogan is "expect chaos," so. For, for you and the Equilibrium team, how would you rank how chaotic it has been for you guys? It's definitely and don't talk question. about the last podcast because that was very chaotic. <laughs> Let's exclude that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Look, uh, it definitely the, this question is easier than the question what I said to the guy if uh, we'll be standing in front of him. Uh, so, <laughs> like, I was I was thinking of this type of question, but okay. So, in terms of like um, how we felt chaotic. Um, um, you know, I, I would say that all the approach that our team is taking is trying to, you know, systemize everything that what, what we are doing. So we are, have very systematic approach at everything. Uh, like even uh, if uh, the announcements of um, uh, coming parachain auctions just popping up from from parity right away, and uh, we, we, we do have certain uh, things to say and to address particular challenge. Uh, so. If, Usually it's not that, uh, you know, chaotic on our side. So I would say it's something like in two, three, whatever, uh, two, three points, because you always have the elements of uh, some, you know, chaotic things when you are in the blockchain space. Uh, but for us, we're trying, like, we're a very technical team and we're trying, you know, to systemize everything. So for us, it's, uh, it's, easy. it's an easy challenge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Well, great. That's great to hear. Okay. Well, where, uh, you mentioned uh, there's a get-together next week. Um, where can people go to find out more about that and uh, just Equilibrium and Jinshiro in general? Absolutely. Feel free to visit our websites, um, equilibrium.io and jinshiro.io. Um, join our uh, social media channels, uh, including Twitter, um, also Telegram groups. They're pretty active these days. Uh, follow me on Twitter as well. Uh, hello, uh, Melikov. Uh, wow, it's uh, easy, easy, uh, easy, easy to pronounce, but uh, it's kind of <laughs> difficult to spell. So uh, never mind. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> just, 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 just follow us and uh, keep up with our announcements. All right. That's great to hear. Okay. Well, 
Thanks again to our guest, Alex. It was great learning more about Equilibrium and their Kusama project, Jinshiro. Uh, so make sure you like, subscribe, and review us on your favorite podcast platform. And we will be sure to bring you backstage to the world of parachain auctions. Until next time, I'm Brian Hoffman, and this has been the Parachain Auctions Podcast. This content is not financial or investment advice. All interviews and discussions are opinions only. Kraken does not endorse the accuracy of this content. None of the following information should be construed as a recommendation to support any specific parachain project or to participate in parachain auctions in general. See our terms of service for more information.